The Daily Beacon Sports Podcast is back with a new name. The Checkerboard Chat or Checkerboard Chatter, whatever it was called before, has been retired. We have a new name and a new crew. So this is now In the Zone, the official UT Daily Beacon Sports Podcast. Today I'm joined with assistant sports editor Eric Woods and lowly staff writer Jack Church. And we're going to talk about some sports. So, Jack, Eric, how are y'all? Doing great. Um, I'm still a little tired from this weekend, but overall, it's been a solid day. I'm good. All right, Jack. I was you doing didn't go well this weekend. Yeah, I was doing well until I was called a lowly staff writer. <laughs> oh well, you know, we can work on the intros. Yeah. We can get there. Today's first day of new podcast name. Next week can be the first week of new intros. So there we go. Nobody listens to us for our intros though. So why don't we dive into some. Tennessee football. We watched a 29 to 16 stinker of a game in Gainesville. Eric and I were there. We've talked about it ad nauseum, wrote about it a ton. Let's get your take, Jack. What happened on defense on Saturday night? So Kamal hadn't played, which wasn't a decision I would have made, first of all. Just him playing at all. Um, I I really thought this defense would have made some improvements. I mean, you have Amari Thomas, Aaron Beasley getting another year of experience under their belt, but just the, the Tennessee defense has a way of making mediocre quarterbacks look like Heisman contenders. We saw it last year with Spencer Rattler in South Carolina and then saw it again on Saturday. I wouldn't go as far to say that Spencer Rattler was not a Heisman. I feel like Spencer Rattler is a little bit better than Graham Mertz. Is that a hot I'd take? agree to. <laughs> I mean, but also Spencer Rattler put up 63 on Tennessee and Greg Burt's put up 29. Yeah, but how much of that? I mean, Trevor Etienne ran for 172 <laughs> yards. A career That's high. true. So, I mean, it's very easy to pass the ball when there's like eight people in the box because right. you have to have eight people in the box. And it still didn't make a difference with Trevor <laughs> Etienne. You talked about Kamal Haddon. I mean, he pushed Trevor Etienne into the end zone on one of his runs. I mean, that was happening. Graham Mertz looked like a, a good quarter. I wouldn't say Heisman quarterback, <laughs> but he looked like a good enough quarterback to win an SEC football game. And I want to say he only threw what four passes in the second half. Yeah, he was he was seventeen of twenty in the first half, and he finished the game nineteen of twenty four. So I don't I don't know whether that's conservatism playing it, um, but he didn't throw the ball as much, and I, apparently they didn't need to. <laughs> I mean, do you credit that to Tennessee's defense, or do you credit that to um, Billy Napier just playing conservative? I mean, I'd say um, I'd say a little bit of both because you see, I mean, it was pretty obvious that it wasn't the same Florida offense because I mean, in the first half you saw, I mean, just first drive you saw all the jet sweeps and um, just just random like short passes, stuff like that, and then. Second half, it seemed a lot like a lot of just running it up the gut and just playing not to lose, which isn't probably not the best strategy. Um, it worked, but but then you look at the defense, and I think uh, Tim Banks talked about it. I mean, Josh Heupel talked about it. All of them said that they liked what they saw out of the defense in the second half. Um, in the first half, they the word I, I heard thrown around was lack of effort in the first half. and um, they said, and then it was basically like, oh, we like their fight in the second half. I mean, it did look a lot better. They were they were stuff in the run. Um, they didn't really have to do much pass defense, but it looked better. Yeah, but I mean, a lack of effort in the first half in an SEC game. And mind <laughs> you, this isn't like, that wasn't Vanderbilt. We're talking an SEC game in Gainesville against your rival in Florida who you compete with every year to win the East. So... Jack, why in the world would we have a lack of effort <laughs> on the defensive end? Why would you see DBs not wrapping up, not tackling, when you just had like your two best defensive performances in Josh Heifel's tenure probably at Tennessee the two weeks before the Florida game? I wouldn't call letting up 13 to Austin P the best defensive performance in the Josh Heifel era for one. Um, but okay, but it was a lot more well-rounded than what we've seen in the past. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you had pass rush, you had pass defense. Uh, that was very hard to come by. 
especially, I mean, you go, go all the way back to his first year. It was even worse, and it got a little bit better. And this year, before Florida, we thought it was a lot better, but now I don't know if we want to say that. Yeah, it's just concerning to me that just these same issues keep popping up for this Tennessee defense. You have you have promises from the coaching staff that this defense is going to improve in the offseason. And then it just turns out that once you get into once you get past the non conference schedule against FCS Austin P, FCS quality Virginia, that you get to, and then you get to Florida and it all falls apart. <laughs> yeah, I mean Arian Carter, who was a freshman who is a freshman who played his first SEC game on Saturday night, graded out the best. Omar Norman Lott, who was also playing his first SEC game an SC, for an SEC team against an SEC team, transfer from Arizona State, he graded out second best. Aaron Beasley, veteran, graded out fourth, and then Jalen McCullough graded out fifth. And then you look to the bottom and you have most of your defensive back room. I mean, one, two, three, four, four of your bottom five are defensive backs. That's not what you want to see. I mean, Graham Mertz is by no means a quarterback. And you look, a good quarterback, and the run defense and their tackling is what hurt. I mean, Wesley Walker graded out at 26.2 for tackling. Kamal Head was 31.2. They both missed three tackles each, and the team missed 11 as a whole. So, I mean, that's not what you want to see from two of your starting defensive backs. And neither guy is a young guy. Neither guy is a freshman. So, Eric, I mean, you have UTSA this week, but what does that look like moving forward past – you know, Saturday against an FCS opponent who will more than likely be playing a backup quarterback. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a little tough because they could go out and have a really good defensive performance and it it wouldn't really matter because of what happened last week. I mean, it could, I mean, it could translate into later in the year, but like at this point, it's like you want to see it against an SEC opponent. And um, I think, I think you can take good things out of that, but uh, moving forward, I think you want to see you want to see a lot more out of the secondary, and um, like like we've been saying this whole time, um, you you want to see more out of that group. Uh, obviously, the defensive line and linebackers didn't do their job necessarily; they weren't getting to the quarterback. But um, but at the same time, I think everything falls on the secondary, and if they can if they can show that they can just get off the field and um, defend pass as well and not I mean you can you can kind of play like I don't know if it's a bend and don't break type thing but there was a lot of breaking last week and I think that's that's the main thing you want to see well I mean if you're playing bend but don't break like you'll give up a five yard pass a yeah. seven yard pass a two yard run I mean we're talking about Trevor Etienne broke off a 62 yard run for a touchdown like there's no bending or breaking there. it was just he was <laughs> gone so I mean I do agree that, I mean, you do see bend, but don't break from Tim Banks off. And, I mean, you have five nickel, five defensive backs on the field. You're running nickel. Aaron Beasley was your leading tackler. And then we also didn't see Nico Slaughter, who is going through some sort of injury, we would assume. Saw Gabe Judulali start, and he didn't play bad at all. I mean, he was probably a bright spot for that secondary. He think first drive for Florida, he had a tackle for loss on the screen. So, you, I mean, you see bright spots there. Aaron Beasley obviously still played phenomenal playing like probably one of the best linebackers in the country, led the way with eight tackles. You still see guys playing well. It just felt like the first half. I mean, a good way to put it would be a lack of effort. It just felt like they didn't want to be there almost. I mean, Eric and I were in Gainesville, and it was electric. I mean, it was super loud. Jack on TV, what? Why would why would the defense not show up? Why would they not want to be there? It doesn't make sense. I mean, the only reason I could possibly think of is just fear. But I mean, it but, shouldn't, I mean, that shouldn't be an excuse. No, and you're not. Ta- I mean, now I would. I I get what you're saying. If we're talking like Tennessee has to roll out six true freshmen, now you're right. like, okay, that makes sense. But I mean, we're talking about like Kamal Haddon, who's been here. Gabe Judy Lolly is a veteran. I mean, Amari Thomas, who had the like, I guess, brain fart at the end of the game. He's a veteran too. These guys, most guys, have played in the swamp before. And if they haven't played in the swamp, most of them played at Georgia last year, mm-hmm. which is probably equal noise level. So, I mean, I I don't know what to say about the defense. And then while you have the defense struggling, <laughs> you go over to the offensive side of the ball, and it felt like the O-line just got back on the bus before the game started. I mean, the play that comes to mind is you have Desmond Watson bearing down on Joe Milton, and Milton is forced to throw it straight up, and he gets picked. Yes, you don't want him to throw it straight up, but 
you also don't want big Desmond Watson to fall on you either. I mean, the offensive line on Saturday, would you say, Eric, is it a Joe Milton thing? Or are we talking like maybe if Joe Milton actually can sit in the pocket, he's a lot more effective? Yeah, see, I don't know because obviously, naturally in in football, um, you, you see it right now in the NFL. You see it in pretty much every program you'll ever see is – um, any any struggles that the team has is um, pretty much placed on their quarterback. And well, well, I don't think obviously Joe Milton didn't play a perfect game. Like that that interception was his fault, but he also had maybe like two seconds to throw it. And at the end of the day, you don't you don't throw up that ball. But at the same time, you got you got to give your quarterback time. And it's the offensive line did have questions going into the year and. Um, you also didn't see Cooper Mays in there, uh, but at the same time, it's just you can't. It's like you said, lack of effort. I don't. I don't. I just. This goes for what we were talking about with the defense too. I just don't get how you can have a lack of effort in such a big game like that. Like these people know how big of a game this is, and I just. I don't see how that's physically and mentally possible. Yeah, Joe Milton was pressured on twenty four point three percent of pass plays, compared to Florida's blitz rate of twenty nine point seven. When Florida blitzed is when Tennessee had the most success, honestly. I mean, everything, when Florida blitzes, they're in the green across the board. But when they're sitting in the coverage and you have a four-man rush or, I mean, on off on the offensive side, I keep talking about PFF grades. I mean, this is crazy. Your bottom five, four offensive linemen for the offensive side of the ball. Your highest graded pass blockers were running backs. Your highest graded run blocker was your tight end, McAllen Castles. That's not really what you want to see, especially from a running back group who had a lot of questions about pass pro coming into the year. They're grading out higher than your offensive linemen who honestly have two jobs, pass block and run block. And like you said, Cooper Mays, we don't know when we'll see him again. He is a big part of this offense. You also saw a ton of procedural penalties from the offense, offensive line as well. I think got five false starts, if I remember correctly. You also had holds that didn't get accepted because they were on third down. Everything started with the offensive line, it felt like. And you can contribute some of that to Joe Milton. Joey Halsley talked about it a little bit on Tuesday. Some of that can be Joe Milton. He's, it's his job to get people in position. But at the same time, Tennessee's not in a huddle. There's no Joe pointing at everybody and telling them where to go. You're supposed to know your assignment. Jack, what did you think of Joe Milton? What did you think of the offensive line? Who is to blame there? I mean, Joe Milton graded out an 80, second highest on the offense. First interception is a ball. Both times he's thrown an interception, Eric sent me the stat. Both times he's thrown an interception, Graham Mertz was the opposing quarterback. First one was against Wisconsin, second one was against Florida. So, or last time he threw an interception, excuse me, at Michigan. Jack, what do you think? Is it a Joe problem? Is it an offensive line problem? And Florida's defensive line is not anything to like write home about. So when they do welcome Georgia to Neyland Stadium in November, when they do go to Tuscaloosa, even South Carolina to an extent, will that offensive line hold up? I don't think this is just a Cooper Mays issue. I mean, you still have major offensive linemen who have gotten this practice time, who have had game time in prior seasons. I just don't know if this scheme fits Joe Milton. I feel like they're just carrying over what they left over from Vanden Hooker and assuming it works for Milton, and they're just not the same quarterbacks. Milton simply doesn't have that some of the abilities that Hooker does. Yes, Joe Milton can throw it further down the field. We all know that. We've all seen him throw the orange 120 yards or whatever it was. But that doesn't mean you can just plop Joe Milton into any scheme and just have him go for it. So what would you what would you change about the scheme? Because from my point, I mean, Josh Heupel's, I mean, you're going you're gonna to have wide receivers with super wide splits. You're going to spread the team out. Your slot receiver is going to be wide open just because that's how he lined up. Teams are playing deep blues, you know, deep coverage on the on Joe Milton, and he's having to complete intermediate routes. What about the scheme would you change? I mean, you can hand it off more, but your offensive line can't pass block. They struggle to run block as well. What would you change? What would you do? I mean, I'd... what what do you think, Jack? I mean, offensive coordinator, Jack? <laughs> <laughs> offensive coordinator, Jack. No, I just got hired away to USF. I'm not the offensive coordinator anymore. Um, I think that, I think, the intermediate passing game. I feel like I feel like when I was watching Tennessee, and maybe this was different because I wasn't there. I was just watching on TV. Y'all saw the whole play develop and all that. But I felt like it was either a two-yard screen pass or a deep ball, and there was just no in between. 
And I think incorporating some more intermediate passing, even if Milton may not be 100% accurate with that, I think you have to just have the threat there so that the defense has to respond to it. And then you open up more of the screen pass and more of the deep ball. Yeah, I feel like you're setting up, you're throwing screen passes to get that rhythm going, which they can never get the rhythm going against <laughs> Florida. So I, I don't even want to like nitpick it as much. I mean, Joey Halsley talked about it today. Their rhythm is you get that rhythm, you get into the game flow, and then you get that tempo going. Well, they, I mean, think about the first drive out of the second, out of halftime. They get out onto the field and call a timeout, out of halftime. And then three, four, five plays later, you're calling another timeout. There is no rhythm there. There's no tempo there when you're calling a timeout. And then when you're not moving fast, you have a penalty, false start on first down. Florida can change personnel out. If you have a tight end in, if you're not going four wide, they can bring in, you know, linebacker and take off a DB. That didn't help either. We've seen Joe Milton have success. I mean, even in the Orange Bowl, if you think about Clemson just sat their safeties and DBs back and let him nickel and dime them underneath. So we've seen him do it. I just think that maybe the protection is not allowing him to see those intermediate routes. Uh, open this up. The defense, I mean, the offensive line is a lot different from last year. And I feel like it was an unsung hero. I mean, Hendon had elite pocket presence and was rarely on the ground. Joe's pocket presence wasn't as good coming into the year. I, we saw some good things from him, I thought, stepping up into the pocket when he threw a deep ball to Dante Thornton over the middle. It's still not there yet, and I feel like it's been trial by fire for his pocket presence. Eric, where do you think the offense goes from here? Um, that's a great question because I think there was, there was a lot of – there was a lot of – or I wouldn't say a lot, but there was, there was some good to come out of it. Obviously, what stands out are the three deep balls, um, but – I don't know. I like. I'd like to see, because we saw it. We saw it a lot in the spring game too. Was um, some design quarterback runs, stuff like that. Just something to, like, take the pressure off. Or just. I mean, I know Joe's not the best at um, throwing on the run and extending those plays, but just finding a way to extend those plays in general. Like as like if if the pocket's collapsing, get out. You know, um, and then as for. Um, you don't you don't want to just say do the deep ball, but um, you'd also like to see, like you said, some more intermediate. So where they go from here, I don't know, but that's why I'm not being paid to make those decisions. <laughs> and then kind of to our next point here, after the game, Joe, which some people got mad on social media because after the interception, after they went three and out like three times in a row, Joe was on the sidelines smiling, cutting up with Nico. Some Running back Joey Halsley, Jalen Wright, Jabari Small said that was his leadership, his poise, his calm, no matter what was happening in the game. He was the same guy. Fans on Facebook thought it meant he didn't care and that he doesn't want to win. What is the leadership of this team, Eric? Do you think Joe said now is either the time they bond or they break? Do you think this team will bond? Do you think they'll break? What do you think is happening in the locker room after going through something like you did at Florida where seemingly nothing went right except you didn't have a kickoff go out of bounds? I mean the most in, <laughs> the most encouraging thing I saw this like from from final from when the clock hit zero to today the the most encouraging thing I saw was um, was the accountability like the first thing Joe said in his press conference it's on me the first thing um, the first thing pretty much everybody said it's on me Halsley it's on me um, and then Tim Banks it's on me stuff like that so. I think I think that's an encouraging sign um, as far as leadership. I think it seemed like there was a very strong leadership group coming coming out of the off season and into this season. So I, if I were if I were a betting man, I'd say I'd say they um, I'd say they write the ship. But also the the Beasley comment was a little concerning. Um, just uh, saying that he's not surprised at the lack of discipline. So there's no telling, but um, if I was a betting man, I think I think they figured out. Yeah, the Beasley comment was interesting. For context, he was asked if the lack of discipline or failure from the defense was surprising, given him, you know, him being at practice every day, fall camp. And there was a long pause, and then he just said, "No, sir." So I don't know if he understood the question, heard the question. I mean, we were in a closet after, I mean, the loudest game I'd ever been a part of, and. Maybe he didn't understand it, and that's what he was saying. That's like the bright side. The dark side would be maybe he fully understood the question and said that, no, he saw the lack of discipline in practice with the defense, and as a leader, you don't want 
I mean, you're Mike linebacker to be saying that. You're now Mike linebacker with Kenyon Peely sideline. What do you think, Jack? I mean, you have leadership. Joe was considered a leader even when he wasn't starting. I mean, Jalen Wright, Jabari Small, Dylan Sampson, all of those guys have stepped up to lead on that offensive side. You have veterans, veteran wide receivers now, Brew McCoy. Even Cooper Mays, through injury, I mean, he's still around the team, still on the sideline. Do you think the leadership will make them bond? Do you think the loss will light a fire under them? Like Brew McCoy said, I mean, what do you think happens to this team in the future? I mean, I remember hearing the news about after the Austin P game about the players only meeting. And everyone kind of said, no, oh, they meet players only after every game and it's only newsworthy because they didn't play well. So w- whether or not that's the case, and the two of you would know more because you're within the team all the time, and I'm a lowly staff writer who covers <laughs> soccer. <laughs> but I just think that if the the concern is that if that Austin P game wasn't a wake up, I don't know if the Florida game will be. Just because you have assist you have a team in place who went through that Austin P game. They all know they didn't play up to the standard. But there wasn't that change that everyone was looking for going into Gainesville. Yeah, and I wonder if Austin P they didn't play well, that's obvious. I mean, even Virginia they had issues with catching the ball. But you still win those games. So it's kind of like, all right, you're sitting in film Saturday night, Monday morning, watching film and your coach telling you everything you did wrong, but then you look at the scoreboard and you won. So I wonder if now, which I assume they are, Josh Heifel, Joey Halsley, are sitting down with the offense like, hey, this play has to be made, this play has to be made, we have to be here, we have to be looking here. After a loss, especially one that, frankly, to start SEC play is probably embarrassing for the team internally, maybe that message resides more now. Maybe the message with the team actually hits now that you have a loss and that it does not get any easier. UTSA is probably better than Virginia and for sure better than Austin P. I I would say. I think that's an easy assumption to make. And they come into Neyland Stadium on Saturday. So you have a lot going on there. I didn't like the comments either, like Eric said, from Aaron Beasley. Nobody really followed up because it was like... It kind of caught us all off guard, I think. I yeah. think everyone around me just kind of went and looked at each other like, what, what the heck just happened? Because normally, you don't hear stuff like that. Even yeah. if it is true, he d- you don't hear like players say it. So that wh- that's why it makes me wonder if he intentionally meant for that to come off that way. I'm not 100% sure. So we've talked about Tennessee a ton. We won't preview the UTSA game just yet. We will do that on Thursday to be released Friday. Schedule's pending. That change every day. And now we're going to pivot to some around college football. SEC foe, Alabama, does not have a quarterback. Jack, what do you think about Nick Saban's team right now? And why are you transferring to Alabama to play quarterback for Nick Saban? <laughs> it's funny because my bro- me and my roommate were watching the game on Saturday and he played soccer and he said, oh, I'm getting on scholarship to go kick for Florida after the first two missed miss kicks. But... In so, the frat house like Lane Kiffin? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I I think it was a mistake not playing, not sticking by Milrow. I mean, it still, it was really uncharacteristic for Milrow to make the mistakes he did against Texas. But I think now, after seeing Buckner play, after <laughs> seeing Simpson play, I think everyone knows that Jalen Milrow is the best quarterback in that room. I still think this Alabama team will rebound. I mean, they're Alabama. That's what they do. They don't have years where they go seven and five, eight and four. Basically, what Kirby Smart says his team is going to do. But so I think I I definitely don't think Tennessee is better than Alabama. I'm not convinced. I'm not honestly not necessarily convinced that Ole Miss is better than Alabama. I did in my poll put Ole Miss one place ahead of Alabama, but that will be decided on the field this week. So I still think Alabama is the favorite in the SEC West, even with LSU playing better. See, I just don't. I mean, the out, the problems for Alabama go beyond quarterback. I mean, they couldn't run against the University of South Florida. <laughs> their defense played all right. That's like the only bright spot for this team right now is their defense has played well. Again, against the University of South Florida, I Josh Pate said that Jalen Milrow may have been suspended for the USF game. Which kind of, I mean, I could see it now because he, I mean, I thought he would play at least some snaps, mm-hmm. but he didn't play anything. Looking at their quarterbacks, Buckner, I don't think, 
Honestly, I don't think Tommy Reese was ready to be the offensive coordinator at Alabama. Buckner, his guy who he brought in from Notre Dame, looked terrible. Ty Simpson looked a little better, I guess, maybe. He showed flashes, but he's not ready. I mean, I think he was, what, 3 for 14? Uh, since the he year. actually, I think he was like 5 for 9, but he also did not leave the pocket. Yeah, so honestly, I don't think Jalen Milrow is probably the best passer, maybe compared to the two in practice. You still have two five-star freshmen that they haven't touched. I don't think Jalen Milrow is probably the best passer of the three, like pure passer, sit back, throw the ball. But Jalen Milrow can run the ball. And that's what Alabama is going to have to do. So pulling up some stats here, Ty Simpson was 5 of 9, 73 yards. So it wasn't a good 5 of 9. Probably not, but it's better than 5 of 14 for 30, <laughs> 34 yards. And you're right, one of his passes was 45 yards. And he got sacked five times. Once again, by the University of South Florida. Alex Golish, coaching genius. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Alex Golish was coaching his defensive line. <laughs> so, I mean, and then you look at Alabama's defense. Yes, they played good against two subpar opponents. But Lane Kiffin said the, the defensive line coach was calling the plays. Not even the defensive coordinator. So... What is happening at Alabama? Eric, what's your stance on Alabama right now? I think it's a very hot take to say they're favorited to win the West. I think it's a hot take to say they're better than Tennessee, honestly. That game will probably be one of the ugliest games of the season when those two teams meet up. (laughs) So what's your take, Eric? What's your take on Alabama, Ty Simpson, Tyler Buckner, and the greatest quarterback room in college football? See, any time Alabama struggles, it's always tough to gauge what's going to happen next because – History says Saban's going to figure it out and what we're talking about now isn't even going to be a problem. But um, that's just because we, I mean, he got there, what, 2000, 2007, 2000, something like that? 2007. And since then, it's just been Bama dominance. But now, I think last year you saw a little bit of regression. and um, So now it's like, do you... Do you bank on you, do you bank on it being Saban, um, just magically turning something around, or are we going to actually look at this team like an actual football team and not a dynasty anymore? You know, so. But it's also it's strange that Bama is having quarterback issues because I don't, I mean, the past four quarterbacks are to a Mac Jones, Bryce Young, and Jalen Hurts, and then before that um, they were. They pounded the rock, but they still had really competent quarterbacks, and so it's 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 tough. I don't I don't know because, like I said, Saban is Saban. He's probably the greatest college coach, if if not all the time in our in our lifetime, of course. So um, I don't I don't know if it's anything to worry about yet. We'll see this weekend, but yeah. Uh, I picked Ole Miss to beat Alabama. Because if Alabama can't score, at least another school who had a a good... I would say Ole Miss had a different quarterback controversy than Alabama. Ole Miss had a lot of guys who could play. Alabama has no guys that can play. (laughs) So I think we're very far off there. And I want to swing over to another SEC favorite, one that applies to us more. Um, SEC East, Kirby Smart coached Georgia Bulldogs. What in the world? Why were they messing around with South Carolina at halftime, Jack? Well, if I say they're going to go 7-5, to five, does that mean I'm going to get put up on the bulletin board? <laughs> Do you think Georgia <laughs> will listen to the newly named In the Zone UT Daily Beacon Sports podcast? I think they have to dig this deep to find people who say <laughs> they're going to go 7-5. and five. But ah, remember, Kirby Smart every year says the doubters are out there. I have yet to see a doubter. I have, I'm looking at one right now. Named I'm Blake not Kirsch. saying they're going 7-5. and five. I, th- <laughs> I mean, okay. Carson Beck, twenty-seven to thirty-five, two hundred sixty-nine yards, got sacked twice. Spencer Rattler, on the other hand, Rattler, excuse me, twenty-two of forty-two, two hundred fifty-six yards, one touchdown, two picks, and I think Georgia, Georgia won twenty-four fourteen in Athens. What, what's to make of this? Ten, I mean, South Carolina had two touchdowns in the first half, and then didn't score in the second half. So was it like a hey? We're sleeping, Eric? Or was it a, hey, ah, Georgia scored three in the first half? It 
You don't want to see Georgia losing to South Carolina 14 to 3 at halftime. Now, if this was Tennessee, Alabama, any team in the SEC, I mean Florida, honestly maybe. But South Carolina, really? What what is wrong with Georgia? I don't know. I mean, Kirby Smart's not a guy that's going to play flashy and run up the score and um, he's not like he's not breaking offensive records or anything and um, I mean for me right now I'd say it's no issue um, but it, I don't know because Carson Beck's a first time starting quarterback who has like as I mean Stetson Bennett drafted in the fourth round but um, I mean couldn't couldn't win the starting job for a long time and but you also see Kirby Smart last year you had off the top of my head, I think of Mizzou where they won by like a point or two. Something is that is that right? Yeah, they went to Missouri and also laid a stinker. And I feel like we were having the same conversation last year. So I mean, I guess it's kind of starting to fall in the um, what I just said about Kirby or about um, Nick Saban. But um, if I were to if I were to say something right now, I'd say it's not really an issue. But we'll see. All right, Jack. I mean. Spencer, okay, here's a stat that's probably very concerning. Spencer Rattler led South Carolina on the ground, rush yards-wise, with 50. And the next closest was 10. So that's not really a successful way to win a game. What do you think, Jack, about Georgia, Georgia football? You are a proud student media poll voter, so I know you research this game heavily. What is your take? And I didn't put Georgia number one. I don't think they deserve to be number one anymore. Maybe that's a hot take because they won. Maybe they were just trying to win. But that was not a dominant performance by a number one team start to finish. Mm -hmm. I mean, I actually watched this game because I was at home while y'all were in Gainesville. (laughs) But the reason I think they're still number one is because I don't think there's a team in college football who's put together three complete performances. Yeah, I mean... That's a very good point. So you're more of the mind of like, hey, nobody else is number one, so might as well leave Georgia up there. I mean, I think they're better than Michigan. I think they're better than Ohio State. I think they're better than USC. I think they're better than Texas. I think they're better than Florida State. So I don't see any reason to not put them number one. Okay. Well, Georgia went to Missouri last year, like we talked about, and barely won. Missouri barely won this Saturday. (laughs) against formerly number 15 ranked Kansas State on a 61 <laughs> yard field goal by the thicker kicker Harrison Mevis. What in the world is Eli Drinkowitz cooking in Missouri? And is this now a team? I mean, Tennessee goes to Missouri. Is this now a team that Tennessee has to worry about? I mean, we're worried about UTSA and Austin P. Is Missouri a team that we have to worry about for Tennessee now as well? I mean, I think at this point, um, given given what we saw last week, every team's a team Tennessee sh- should worry about unless they unless they like return to some type of last year form. But um, I didn't I didn't follow the game that closely. But you remember we were in the car and I turned it on my phone. Right, I right, think I think right there was as, about five seconds left. And right as the Burger King <laughs> himself <laughs> threaded the uprights and the half empty stadium flooded the field. I mean. Seriously, Missouri, Brady Cook, 23-35, 356 yards. They, I mean, they. you look at the end of the game. You have a delay of game, and you fail to put together any sort of drive that would constitute looking like you practiced the two-minute drill. And you looked like, they looked like Missouri at the end, and Eli Drinkowitz coached Missouri. And then your kicker drills a 61-yard field goal, so nobody's going to remember that. They're just going to remember the field goal. Tennessee already lost to Florida. You've got Georgia on the schedule. Alabama's on the schedule. You travel to Missouri in November, which is already tough because it's going to be probably 30 degrees and snowing because it's never fun in Columbia. My kind of weather. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> what Can Tennessee win the SEC East? Is that even still in the cards for this team? I think you'd have to win out. Okay, you win out. Can, do you think they can win out? No. Who do they lose to? What's your record prediction now? What was your record prediction before Saturday, and what is it now? My record prediction before Saturday was 10-2 and with loss to Alabama and Georgia. I don't see enough evidence that Tennessee is going to 
win either of those games, but at the same time, I don't see enough evidence that any of those other games would flip, so I'll go 9-3 and three now. See, I'm still on the right path. I said 10-2, and two, and I said they would lose to Alabama on the road, because Josh Heibel can't win on the road, or he struggled to win on the road, and they would lose to another team not named Georgia. So in theory, if they beat Georgia and lose to nobody else, my record prediction is still correct. To be fair, I thought that loss would be to like Texas A&M, not Florida on the road, a poor Florida team on the road. Eric, what was your score prediction before the or your record prediction? Excuse me, before the season, what do you think this team can do, and do you think they can win the SEC East? My record prediction was ten and two, like literally everybody else. Um, but I mean, I had I had losses to Georgia and Alabama. I don't think I don't think they go to Bama and win. I don't, it's very, it's still, no matter what Georgia looks like right now, it's still tough, even at, even in Neyland, to see that win. Um, and then you have, you have a few toss-ups, like, uh, I mean, A&M isn't playing the best football right now, but, I mean, that's, that, that's always, you never know what A&M is going to look like week to week, so, um, and then, so, I mean, I'd still, I'd probably, if I was, if I'm being confident, I'd say nine and three right now. Um, but there's still there's still a lot that needs to be figured out. There's a long road to ten and two or nine and three or wherever this team wants to go. And that starts Saturday. I don't know how much we'll be able to take out of Saturday. At the very least, you want to build up a big enough lead to see your freshman at all. And then South Carolina comes to Neyland Stadium for a night game. Jack thinks it's going to be a dark out, black jerseys for that night game. I would re- probably agree. That's going to be a big one. There's a lot to talk about. We talked about some today on the first episode of the UT Daily Beacon in the Zone Sports Podcast. We'll try to get another one in this week with our predictions for the weekend. A lot of games, including Tennessee's, talk about whatever Josh Heupel says tomorrow and on Wednesday or Thursday. Any parting thoughts? Um one other note, Rick Barnes got extended today. Yeah, let's talk about some Rick Barnes. There you go. <laughs> Uh-oh. Literally, right before we got on to do this podcast, we were sitting in a meeting, and Rick Barnes got an extension following a Sweet 16 appearance. So he is now extended through the 27-28 season. During his time at Tennessee, I'd, I'd go out to say that he's probably one of the, if not the, best coaches Tennessee has had. It's the fifth contract extension for Barnes in the past six years. So we see Danny White continuing the trend of adding a year to the end of the contract as long as you're doing good. He's won 25 games at least four times or in the top four tournament seed. Yet, Tennessee fans are still not happy. Eric, why will Tennessee fans not be content with Rick Barnes? I think that's more of a Jack question. But... <laughs> Because I don't, I don't see any reason to be. I mean, obviously the standard at Tennessee and any sport, like any SEC school in any sport, is championships. But at the same time, it's not like Tennessee is not a blue blood basketball program, and you're not gonna. I don't know if like national championships should be the expectation, but I don't know if that's necessarily realistic. They've had, I mean, they've had some good teams come over the years, and. Um, Pretty much all of those have been a Rick Barnes led team outside of like that the one Bruce Pearl year and then yeah um, and I mean I will say they have underachieved I mean look at last season yes a Sweet Sixteen appearance and you lost to Florida Atlantic in the Sweet Sixteen that would have been an easy road to the Final Four and me Jack and I have had this conversation a lot Rick Barnes has you in the tournament or competing every year. If you get rid of Rick Barnes to try to win a championship, Mm -hmm. you're taking a gamble there. You could get a new coach that will not not have you anywhere close, or you could have a terrible season. Or what? And Jack, what do you think? I mean, the Rick Barnes (laughs) extension. He's also in a time where every coach seems to be going through a scandal. You won't have a scandal with Rick Barnes. He runs a tight ship, good program. Pros, cons. What do you think about the extension? I mean, to compare it to football, it's if if you decide to move on, you can either end up like Georgia and win back to back national championships, or you can end up like Nebraska and be struggling for bowl eligibility or struggling to make it into the tournament. But so I don't know if it's a risk you want to take because 
Tennessee men's basketball is at a point where it's it has the low it has the highest floor it's ever had. Mm-hmm. And the ceiling is probably close to as high as it's going to get. But we all know how Tennessee fans are. They always want more. They want to push further. They want to go to the Final Four for the first time in program history. So I think, I'm, I assume Danny White has had, this, had these conversations with the boosters or whoever it may be about, do you want the certainty you have or do you want to take the risk? And I assume based on the money that's going to Rick Barnes that the boosters have chosen that they want that certainty. Yeah, and I mean, Rick Barnes is 175-92 while at Tennessee. He's also 68. So in theory, he will probably retire sooner rather than later. And he's had a successful career. I mean, you think all the way back to Texas with Kevin Durant, which at Texas, he also struggled to win the big games, win the Final Four, get to the championship. But he was always there, and Mm -hmm. there were no scandals. So no big scandals. So I agree that you take the certainty. There's not a lot of certainty in sports, especially at Tennessee. There's not a lot of certainty (laughs) in sports in Tennessee's history. I think you take the certainty. I like the extension. I don't like that it came out on 4.30 at 4.30 on a Tuesday. <laughs> but the Hickory, North Carolina native has ex- gets a contract extension from Danny White, will be the men's basketball coach for an extra year on the end of his contract, probably make a little bit more money, hopefully make back the money. Barnes was one of the coaches who took a contract, a pay cut during COVID to help the athletic department survive. So I think, I mean, in the end, it'll pay off for him. I think it'll pay off for Tennessee. You'll be there. This team this year, We've seen Rick Barnes go away from what he's used to. You mm-hmm. don't have a Euros in the post this year. You have bigs who can shoot. I think that'll help Tennessee take an extra step, maybe a Sweet 16 to an Elite Eight. Because I don't think the game really, and Eric, you can add, you're a basketball guy. I'm <laughs> much, most certainly not, unless it's 2K. <laughs> Adding shooting bigs, kind of spreading the floor, is something Rick Barnes hasn't done in the past, but it can definitely help this team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is stretching the floor, and the biggest, the biggest problem Tennessee has had under Rick Barnes is the offense. And um, when you have, especially like you can only with Urosh, you could only, you could only play him about ten minutes a game before he clogs up the paint, and you can't like the offense just stalls out. Same, I mean, even like Olivier, he was a he was a good shooter, but um, he was also he was also down low a lot and eating up a lot of. A lot of stuff down there but um i mean when you when you have bigs that can that can shoot that just creates more for zakai ziegler to drive whenever he comes back same with santi and um, josiah to and then you get the driving kick game and stuff like that so i think i think that makes this team a lot more dynamic and um and we'll we'll just see because the I, rick barnes will always have a great defensive team but there's those like like you mentioned earlier against Florida Atlantic um they can't there's a lid on the basket and the they, they can't do anything about it like I think I think it was Arkansas or who was that this year where it was just a complete dud of it I think it was Arkansas no it was the Auburn game it was Auburn that's <laughs> yeah, what it was, it was like 47 50 or something and then crazy. before that it was like Texas Tech and it, yeah. it always seems to happen in tournaments too so um I mean, tournament basketball is a lot different than regular season, but I think just just finding a way to make that offense more dynamic will do wonders. Yeah, make the offense more dynamic. We are making ourselves more dynamic with the In the Zone podcast. Yes. Checkerboard chatted no more. It had right. a good run. Lots of great people have come through. We are now in the zone. But as for Eric Woods, Jack Church, and myself, we are going to get out of the zone and go home <laughs> because it is 6 o'clock. So Ouch. this has been episode one of the In The Zone podcast. For Jack and Eric, I'm Caleb, and we will hopefully see you all again later this week.